Hello, everyone. I'd like to welcome you to our February webinar on It Takes a Village, Preparing Your Support Plan for Transplant Care. My name is Kathy Nickham, and I'm the Education Director for the BPC Ed Center. Before we get started, let's do a couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, all of your lines are muted. You can unmute by pressing pound six to ask questions, preferably at the end of the presentation. Or you can do mute six. Uh, you can mute your phone by doing star six after you ask a question. You're also able to put your questions in the chat box. And after the presentation, Hillary will ask them to our speaker. And you'll be receiving a link to the recording and the slides by email. So please complete the feedback form at the end of the program. Today's presenter is Laura Tushla. And Laura is a nephrology social worker. Uh, she did her internship on the renal team at the VA in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And she never left. She was an outpatient dialysis social worker for six years and became the social worker for the kidney and pancreas transplant team at Rush University Medical Center in 1998. And over the years, Laura has written and presented on a variety of topics to patients and professionals. At this point, I'd like to turn the program over to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Kathy. And I would like to thank the Dialysis Patient Citizens Education Center uh, for inviting me to talk about this important conversation, this important topic of being a transplant candidate. Um, we're going to specifically talk about um, support system and being ready for transplant. I do want to say sort of briefly that um, transplant, transplant candidacy is a very important topic and there are a lot of very difficult things that we talk about in relation to any treatment option. And so while I appreciate how important all of this is and how serious it is, I also um, do like to add a little bit of levity and lightness in things that are otherwise difficult. So um, please know that even if I'm sort of joking on things that I do take this all very seriously. There are a lot of factors that go into deciding if someone is the transplant candidate. There is um, a lot of education and research and um, best practice guidelines that are used by transplant centers, by the um, United Network on Organ Sharing, the govern various government organizations insurance uh, criteria, as well as the experience of the individual centers. Most of the evaluation process, or, or a big important part of it, is the medical evaluation. So a lot of the process of deciding if someone is a transplant candidate is looking at, are they healthy enough for transplant surgery? Do any health issues need to be addressed or improved prior to being a candidate? Um, there are a few, there are a percentage of people who, for whom transplant surgery and the long-term management of transplant may actually be riskier than other treatment options like dialysis. So um, I tell people that sort of the last thing we want to do on the transplant team is to create more problems for individuals coming to our center. So there is a very thorough evaluation um, to determine all of those things from a, a variety of team members. So for people on this call who have either started the process for transplant or listed or who are thinking about it, there, um, the transplant evaluation, you meet a large number of uh, multidisciplinary professionals from nurses and surgeons, nephrologists, cardiologists, pharmacists, dietitian, um, as well as um, providers that are dealing with other medical conditions. So it is a, a very extensive evaluation. Um, and I will say that 
a lot of the criteria for transplant is standard between transplant centers. There are some center-specific uh, criteria that may be a challenge at one center that might be acceptable at another center. So if, um, if someone is found not to be a candidate at our center, we strongly encourage them to go to other centers for a second opinion. And that can be easier said than done. And I'm based in Chicago, and um, so there are, in the city of Chicago, in the immediate uh, suburbs, there are six adult kidney transplant programs, and uh, I believe five of us also do pancreas transplants. So there are uh, definitely there are options. That that's not always the case in other parts of the country, but. Um, but second opinions are all, can always be a good idea. The, I put this list up not be, only just to point out that the criteria that transplant centers use are ones that we're trying to meet not only our individual um, policies and perspectives on things, but we also have a lot of oversight from from a variety of places, as you can see on this list, those of you that are um, looking at the slides, um, federally, state-based, our own hospital quality improvement programs. And the last one um, is the commercial insurance company guidelines. Um, that can surprise people sometimes that um, we may be comfortable with a particular person as a candidate, but their insurance company has some reason why they're not clearing them. So it's um, so there are a lot of people who have opinions about who's a candidate for a transplant. We're going to talk mainly about the social work part of the evaluation process, um, and and we're going to spend most of the time talking about support. But um, I put on this slide the guidelines and the policies that are our um, listing criteria for transplant and the specific ones for social, from my perspective, the social worker perspective. The um, listing criteria, all centers, um, if um, are required to share those with dialysis units, providers, and patients, if it's um, ever something you have, uh, would be interested in seeing for your own information. They do tend to be fairly general because you're trying to capture in very big picture terms what is a very individual evaluation process. Um, but so just sort of hitting the highlights on this one, the inclusion, the one thing that is required to be a transplant candidate to be included is if someone has um, between the person and we'll, I'll go back and forth between person and patient. The person and the patient support system are able to comply and, uh, with medications and other follow-up um, protocols and requirements. Those are, um, that is a big part of managing a transplant. The relative contraindications, so those are things where there are some concerns if people fall into this group. It does not mean they're absolutely not a transplant candidate, but this is generally a group of people that um, will need to do some additional work to determine transplant candidacy. So limited support system, confirming if there's a confirmed history of noncompliance with medical recommendations, um, the piece there is that we're going to ask that the um, that there be improvement in that before we get too far into the transplant evaluation process. So a, a history of not following medical advice does not per, prevent someone from ever getting a transplant. Um, we're really kind of looking at where where are you now? As a, um, are you able to follow now? Have you put things in place to do well following the recommendations? Um, so it's, um, again, it's not a permanent mark in your, uh, against uh, someone who has a history of noncompliance, but making sure that that's addressed so that, you, that people do well post-transplant. Um, if there's evidence of uncontrolled mental illness, the key word there is uncontrolled. 
Um, same thing with the current drug or alcohol abuse. The key is current and uncontrolled. Both of those would need to be addressed prior to being a transplant candidate. Um, and then the absolute contraindication, so something that would say someone is definitely not a candidate for transplant from the social worker perspective is if there is not, um, if there's an inadequate support system um, and if there's a diagnosis of Alzheimer's or dementia that's uh, documented in the record. What we're looking for is making sure that people have the best chance of success after transplant. We're not looking at just the immediate post-transplant period, but for years and years and years to come. Um, for any, if anyone on the call has had a transplant, this is a long-term lifetime commitment and relationship with the transplant program and taking care of the transplant. So it's um, making sure people do well in the short run, but in the long run as well. So those are the, the things that the sort of qualifiers and disqualifiers, if you'd like to use that term. Everybody meets with the social worker as part of the evaluation process for transplant and then periodically while you're on the waiting list. In Illinois, we generally say our wait time is between four and five years. So every couple of years um, on, while you're on the waiting list, um, at least every couple of years, I'll meet with people who are on the list and, and going through the process because things change support system changes, insurance changes, um, work changes, and so we want to make sure that, um, that we kind of remind and revisit people of the things that uh, they should have in place to do well with transplant afterwards. The evaluation is, um, can this, so psychosocial is the term that we use for the social work evaluations because um, it's looking at someone fairly holistically. Um, and you'll see on there we're looking at how well do um, people understand what's going on with their health, how well are they following, managing that, um, are they working, what do we need to talk about, time off of work, disability, the fact that you could lose uh, disability benefits after transplant, insurance, mental health, you know, these are the things that we're looking at um, when we're talking. I would say the uh, social work interview, the psychosocial assessment could take anywhere from half an hour to a couple of hours depending on, on what's going on um, and how, how many questions people have or their family, whoever is um, with them in the room. The, um, and that's why I kind of, well, that's part of why we meet people multiple times because there's so much information that you're learning in the various appointments with the doctors and the nurses. It's easy to, to get overwhelmed. And so in, in my mind, I like to meet with people over time so that information can sort of sink in and you think of more questions down the road as, as things happen in your life. So those are the, the things that we're talking about. Um, this is one of the things that you're supposed to take um, and understand that I'm bringing a little bit of levity here to this topic. So um, when, I've, when I'll talk with providers, we'll talk about sort of who's the perfect transplant candidate. Um, somebody who goes to every dialysis treatment stays the entire time, whether that's you know, PD and how long they're set up with the cycler, doing the in-center dialysis, but they go to all their appointments, set them up themselves, don't need reminders, take medications 100% of the time, on time, managing all their health issues, reaching out for help, arranges transportation, has backup drivers. Um, if a person has a mental health or substance use history that, that it's under, either currently or have been treated and knows how to reach out for help when, uh, when help is additional help is needed. Um, this is kind of one of the things that I say very seriously is that I want people to live their life to the fullest now. Um, 
there, when I worked in dialysis, um, one of the nurses used to say you should dialyze to live, not live to dialyze, meaning that your dialysis keeps you well enough to do what's important in your life. It shouldn't be your whole life. So um, I, I really hope that people are able to, to do things that they enjoy now, that they're not just leaving the house to go to various doctor's appointments. So I encourage people to think about ways to expand their activities. And people who are calling into a webinar like this is probably a group of people who are already doing a lot of things outside of the um, health care. Um, and then also having a robust support system um, with backup caregivers would be lovely. So have I found the perfect person, the perfect transplant candidate? No. Um, and why not? Because we're human. Um, so it's really a matter of um, piecing together things and doing the best that you can um, in the various areas of your life. And the, again, these are the things that we're talking about during that assessment. Um, we are, we are uh, humans ourselves on the team and know that there are um, things that we all do well and that we all need help with. Uh, so um, trying to keep those things in mind. After the social work assessment, we're going to walk away with a plan. Um, so there's a group of people who, when I meet, everything seems to be in place. I have no concerns. They're ready to go. I'll see them in a couple of years for an update. Um, there's a group of people who have a lot of concerns and are not a candidate um, at this time and maybe might not be able to be a transplant candidate. And then there's a group of people who have what I refer to as homework to become a candidate. Um, so that could be mental health treatment, substance use treatment, improving adherence, you know. Um, and by that, we're kind of looking at are you going to, if you're on dialysis, are you going to dialysis? Are you staying the pretty darn close to the full time? Are you weight gains reasonable is your, if you're diabetic, is your hemoglobin A1C at a reasonable place? How's your PTH? So we're, we're looking at um, substitute markers for adherence to see how people are doing. Um, some people are going to need to work on um, improving their support system, getting that a little bit stronger. Uh, some people need to work on trying to take a deep breath when I talk about insur improving insurance because that is one of those things that's a whole lot easier said than done, but it is definitely something we talk to folks about. And then people get a, you know, a period of time to work on those things and then reach back out to us for, um, for a follow-up where we revisit uh, and reevaluate. Probably the number one reason why social work, why people don't get social work clearance, at least on that first visit, in my experience, is the reason why we're talking today, and that is lack of a support system. And a lot of people are do question me about what, um, why, why do I push so hard about support system? I get myself to dialysis. I'm independent now. I do everything for myself. I manage my medicines. I you know, get myself to appointments, handle all the household stuff. I do everything now, grocery shopping. Why do I need support? And it's really not a matter of questioning people's ability now. It is the reality that this is major surgery and everybody needs help while recovering from surgery. Um, I took these from Google Images, uh, so I don't know any of these people. Um, but these are transplant, these are incisions from kidney transplant surgery. Um, and so you'll see this is a pretty big incision. Um, I generally 
tell people, you know, six to eight inches. Um, so that's big surgery. The operation itself is several hours long. Um, it's a relatively short hospital stay, so three to five days um, after transplant is is pretty short um, for in a lot of people's minds. Um, the day of surgery and the day after for a lot of people are kind of a blur with the anesthesia and the pain medicines and nobody sleeps normally in the hospital and you've got high dose steroids. You know, most people don't, you know, really aren't very clear the day of surgery and the day after. And the day you leave the hospital is fairly chaotic. There's a lot that people are trying to do the day you leave the hospital. So that leaves a day or two in the well, where you're clear enough to learn and it's calm enough to learn all the things that you need to know to take care of that new kidney with what medicines you're starting, which ones you're stopping, what's the sign of an emergency that you call us anytime, day or night, what things wait till the morning, signs of infection or rejection. There's a lot of sort of nitty gritty details that you need to know from day one to go home and do well with transplant. And it's hard to learn all of that and retain it right after surgery. Um, that being said, everybody's different. So there's some people that you'll see right after surgery who are who look amazing. You would never guess they just had major surgery. They're walk, walking around looking great. And other people who are um, fairly limited from the surgery um, for a fair, you know, for weeks with uh, discomfort and pain. So it's different, but you need to have a plan for this. Um, generally, you're not up to driving. I would say most people are not up to driving for a couple weeks. Could be longer if it's a long drive or here when there's traffic, which is always um, in construction. So it's, uh, you know, you might be up to a week or two after surgery going to the uh, grocery store to pick up, you know, a loaf of bread, but you're not going to be up to drive in um, an hour down to see us um, after, right after surgery. Um, there is a 10-pound lifting restriction, which is pretty common for any abdominal surgery. Um, the muscles, um, like I showed those pictures, the kidney, uh, just to be clear, the vast majority of people were leaving their kidneys in. We're just adding a new one in the front. Um, so kind of between your belly button and your hip bone is where that uh, incision usually is. Um, so using those muscles, you use those when you, the, your stomach muscles when you sneeze, cough, laugh, go to the bathroom, turn, drive, get out of bed. You're, I mean, you're using them for everything. Um, the official restriction from the surgeons is that 10-pound lifting restriction for a month. Um, that's a gallon of water. So for a month, you're not carrying groceries, laundry, garbage. You're not doing yard work. You're not carrying kids, probably not doing a lot of pet care. Um, it affects a lot of things that you do. If you do too much too soon, you risk getting a hernia in that at the incision, which means you're going back to the operating room and a setback in a lot of ways. So um, there are some, some real restrictions that you have during that recovery. On the other hand, you're not an invalid. Um, you don't need 24-hour care. Uh, you don't need somebody sitting at the end of the bed watching you sleep. Um, I like to tell people that um, you don't get to lay in bed and ring a bell and have people go get you snacks. Um, you, so it's a fine balance. You're not an invalid, but you need help. So I would say the day after surgery, people are generally up to sitting in a chair uh, in the room. They might be able to walk around a little bit um, in the room usually, going to the bathroom, washing up, um, and every day getting a little bit more and more mobile. Um, and they're going to start teaching 
the person who just had the transplant about taking care of that kidney right away. They're going to be teaching about the medicines and the side effects of the medicines and the, um, the uh, what you take, when you take it, uh, signs of infection. You know, they, they're going to be teaching the patient, the person who just got the transplant, but we also, we want backups to that. Um, people are able to go to the bathroom and shower independently. I would say probably the first time you take a shower at home, you might want to make sure someone's in the house, just in case you are more tired than you would have expected. You could probably do some light cooking and, you know, make a sandwich, throw something in the microwave. You can do some little stuff like that. Um, but it's, it's a, like I showed you those pictures, that's a pretty big surgery. So we're, uh, so it's finding that balance between being independent and active and needing help with things. So what are we asking the support system to do as a transplant program? Um, we, the kinds of things we need someone to be helping you with is, um, again, I kind of mentioned this earlier, someone that would be able to come to the hospital with you while you're in to be learning with you how to with uh, with you how to take the medicines, take care of the new kidney and or pancreas or liver, um, be able realistically to be able to take some time off for appointments in the few weeks, uh, the first couple of weeks. Um, it is ideal if someone comes with you for those first few visits while you're recovering just to help you navigate the system because um, all the at least all the hospitals around here are very large and so from the parking garage to our office is um, is a hike <laughs> and so some people will use wheelchairs and stuff but it is you know the hospitals ones that you can borrow but it's a long walk and it's nice to have someone with you um, this one I don't know how many centers require this or um, I would say probably we all prefer it. It is something that is a requirement here is that um, the patient not be alone for the first month. So when I say that, I say that I'm meaning, I'm trying to say that um, you don't, like I said, you don't, people don't need 24-hour care right after surgery. But we also don't want them somebody just popping in for an hour or two on their way home from work. So our expectation is either that the, the someone stay at the person who just got the transplant, the patient's home for several weeks, maybe a month, or that the patient stay with someone at their home if that's easier. Um, when we are alone, we tend to push ourselves to try to do things um, even if part of us knows we shouldn't do it yet, we often are impatient. I know I'm, I'm including myself in the we. Um, and so it's easy to push yourself a little too fast if there's uh, not someone there that can help you with things. So our expectation is that someone would, you know, come after work and spend the night um, for several weeks after surgery just to provide extra support to the person um, right after transplant. We are oops, asking that the, the support system be able to help manage medications, particularly right after transplant when the doses change a lot, um, whether it's them being primarily in charge of it or just being the backup uh, double checker uh, one way or the other. Um, we would want the support system to either uh, provide, you drive themselves, find drivers, coordinate friends, family, transportation services, um, things along those lines to help people get to and from the hospital for the follow-up care. Here, our, expect, our requirement is that you come two times a week for the first month after transplant and then the visits are gradually less frequent. So it starts out fairly intense. Um, the earlier we find a problem with the kidney, the better chance we have of fixing it. So we, 
were pretty intense in the beginning. Um, we would want the support system to be able to take over whatever household chores the patient's been doing for, for that first month where there's the 10 pound lifting restriction. Some people at the end of the month might need a little bit of help. A lot of people are able to do pretty much everything for themselves, so it would depend on how the person was, their recovery was going. And then it sort of related to the household chores or whatever other responsibilities. So um, child care, pet care, elder care, you know, those sorts of other things that, um, you know, they, we all wear many hats in our families and our households. And so sometimes um, some of the things that we do, somebody else will need to help out for a while during the, during the recovery. And it's the time to be planning for these things is before the transplant. It is easier to think of who's going to help with these things um, when things are going, when nothing too exciting is happening than when you get home and realize that you have a fever, <laughs> you know, you're uh, having trouble keeping food down, um, and how are you going to get back to the hospital when we 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 would like the support system to be able to help reach out on behalf of the recipient. So often when we're sick, the last thing we want to do is leave the house. Um, we're comfortable in our own bed, our own bathroom, you know, our own snacks. We want to, you know, you don't want to go out, um, but sometimes that's the time you do need to go out. So if a person is having a hard time under realizing that, because Sometimes our family realizes we're sick before we do. Um, so helping find those, you know, identify that as a concern and reaching out or helping the patient reach out to the transplant office. And then also just sort of generally letting the transplant team know if there's things going on that we need to know. Are there problems accessing medications, insurance changes, appointments? Um, for a lot of people right after surgery, there's a lot going on, and so any little any help with these things is uh, can really make a difference. Um, what the support system does not need to do is be a superhero. Um, this is um, we are asking we are not asking the support system to necessarily even be one person. Um, a lot of families that set up where it's one person, um, but it is helpful. We actually, I actually like it if there's a backup to that person or uh, or a team of people, because if one person gets sick, then who's going to help out while that person's recovering from the flu, for example? The support system does not need to be related by blood or marriage. Um, even though a lot of things we're asking people to do sound very um, medical, uh, you don't need to be medically trained. We uh, will teach you what you need, what the support people need to uh, to know in order to help you um, or the recipient. Um, support people don't need to take a month off of work. Um, this is often something people are, you know, taking days here and there, so we definitely help with Family Medical Leave Act paperwork, um, letters to employers asking for flexible hours and things. Um, and the support person doesn't have to be uh, super strong. So, because you're, after transplant, you're walking and you're doing stuff, you, um, you need some help, but you're not an invalid. Um, it can be surprising what has worked and what has not worked um, in my 20 and a half years here at Rush. Um, I have seen things I, where the, what's worked is a support system that was a group of neighbors. I've seen church family be very successful in helping someone manage after transplant. Extended family ex-spouses. Um, that one, I think the first time that happened, I was a little suspicious, but it, it, um, but it worked really well. Um, and it happens more than I would have guessed. Um, coworkers have been very helpful um, in being part of the team. And the things that you assume would work, um, some of those have failed, where spouses 
um, the person was counting on their husband or wife. Um, we had a gentleman who, whose wife was very involved for helping, with helping him manage his medicines and all the programs he was in. Um, and then she had to leave because her father was dying, so she went to go help take care of her father. And while she was gone, the, trans the recipient, and this was years after his transplant, he sort of lost focus and we lost track of him for a while until he um, ended up in the hospital um, very, very sick. Um, we've had adult children not be able to help their um, parent deal with transplant. We've had siblings and parents where there have been a lot of problems and, and paid caregivers where there have been a lot of problems. So it's, there's no, no one size fits all, um, which is sort of, I mean, the reality in healthcare. We are all individuals and what works for one person doesn't necessarily work for the next. Um, I have learned a few things along these lines is that particularly when it's a group of people um, and it often is a group of people, even if it's family, often there is somebody, you know, a retired uncle who does a lot of the driving and um, one family member who deals with all of the insurance stuff and another one who handles all the medicines and doctor's appointments. And so whether the, the support is a very traditional set of family members, if it's an untraditional group, um, what I've learned is that it's helpful if there's sort of one person who's in charge of coordinating who does what so that you're not duplicating services, you're reducing stress for the different caregivers so they all know what their role is when they need to be involved and when, when they step away. Um, with, um, it also is very important or very helpful if there's a point person along with the patient, but a point person in that support group, you know, I'm saying support group not as in a, like a therapy group, but in a group of people providing support, a support group where one person is sort of in charge of uh, talking with the transplant program in addition to the patient so that there's less chance of mixing things up. And um, I've had a few families use notebooks um, so that it's clear, you know, meds, the, took the medicines at this time, they had a fever or they were having issues with diarrhea or whatever. It was all kind of in one place so everybody knew what was going on and then they would bring that book when they came to the office visits so we could, um, everyone could communicate and, and it was all kind of in one place. Um, there are people in, where, um, where there are family and friends that they can turn to, but they don't care to ask for help. Um, and there are people who actually don't have anyone that they can turn to. And so sometimes breaking down the different tasks that need to be done seems much more manageable to ask, you know, would you be able to help me with a ride? Would you be able to um, spend the night twice a week? Things like that. Um, I have a couple of situations that I'm going to share um, along those lines. So I had a, a gentleman that was in his upper 60s. He was single and he had no children, but he lived in the same, um, it was a family-owned building with his sister and brother-in-law. He had lived there for years with them. They were both retired. He was in the downstairs apartment. Um, they had two daughters, so he had two nieces that were nurses that worked at the nearby community hospital. Everybody lived close by. The nieces who were nurses um, had been involved in his care for a number of years. Um, so it seemed like this is a, a group um, that's got practice working together. They've got medical expertise, which we don't actually uh, require in any sort of way. Um, after the transplant, he had, he had a lot of problems with urinary tract infections um, and ended up getting hospitalized a few times with those. And every infection seemed to take more of his strength and his energy and 
and motivation, I would say, away, and he became gradually more frail. Eventually, after one of the infections, he was needing uh, very complicated IV antibiotics. Um, so they, he ended up going to a skilled nursing facility, a nursing home for a while, and we ran into problems, and this is, he's not the only one that we've had these issues with, but I bring it up because it, using one sort of example, um, is he, the staff at the um, nursing home, because of the staffing ratios, it's hard for them to give medications at specific times. And the transplant medicines have to be given at the right time. So we had a lot of problems where he wasn't getting things on time. And um, so there would be times when maybe it would be a few hours late and then the kidney is vulnerable in that time. We also found that they were changing medicines because they have their own formularies. Now, they weren't changing the transplant medicines, but things like blood pressure medicines and his diabetes management. Um, and we, we weren't aware of those changes until either he got admitted or came into our office. So we um, had some challenges with the, them changing medications. He, um, trans and when you hear ads on TV for um, any medication out there, you have sort of that lawyerly sounding person at the end that gives the, all the disclaimers. And in transplant, we are, um, with, there are so many drug interactions with our stuff that we talk, we have pharmacists on our team because we have so many drug interactions. So making changes can be um, without really us knowing. We, we need to know when changes are made so we can adjust our, the dosing of our medications if needed. And it was very difficult for him to come to our office for follow-up visits um, and to get blood draws on time even at the nursing home. Um, I have a gentleman now who brought me some bills where he was at a nursing home after a toe amputation and they, um, while he was there, they brought him back and forth and he's gotten bills for those rides that are $150 round trip that he wasn't expecting um, or he didn't, if, he, if they told him he didn't understand that that's what they were telling him. Um, and over time, this, this gentleman, this example became less active and less and more frail and eventually passed away. And so he, his transplant lasted less than a year and he was hospitalized or in a skilled faci nursing facility for much of that time. Um, so that's a, a support system that we would have thought would have been sufficient, but those, the medical complications stretched even their abilities. On the other side, this is a situation I would have not expected to work, um, but it did. Uh, a 59-year-old woman who also was single with no children, but she didn't have any, uh, had no siblings, her parents were deceased, and um, had no connection really with remote family members that were far away. So she told me that she had close friends in the building that were going to help, and um, that makes me nervous. Um, because we all have, there's friends and then there's friends. And so I wasn't sure how that was going to go. So we, we had a meeting um, with her and a couple of the friends. And I laid out all the different things that family and friends might need to do. And they put together a beautiful plan to help cover those activities. Um, and one person was kind of the coordinator in charge. She knew who was going to do what. She, I think, even used, um, there's some websites out there that help coordinate uh, caregivers. Um, and so I think she used one of those to help coordinate all of it. Um, and her, she's been transplanted three years, and at least three years at this point, and is still doing really well. The, over the years when she's had minor illnesses, the friends have been able to step back into those roles and help her because this is you know, lifetime that you might need some additional help. So, um, so we've learned that you got to be open-minded and willing to investigate things. If you um, if you have thoughts or concerns about what it is the needs that you would that you may have specific to your situation, 
Um, so somebody who is very, um, is maybe 30 years old, um, no significant medical history other than the kidney problems, working, active, that person may need a little less physical support um, than someone who's um, had an amputation and needing a, you know, additional support prior to transplant. So getting an understanding of exactly what you might need help with. Um, and if you're not sure who, who to ask in your life about who could help with different things, um, I have been willing to, you know, open to helping brainstorm and think about things um, at the transplant centers would, you know, be able to do it because we've, we've seen different scenarios that have worked, so we try to help uh, share ideas. Um, and the, the people at dialysis, if you're on dialysis, they also have seen um, support systems that have, that have worked well um, and ones that have, have struggled a little bit more. And the dialysis unit sees, knows you much um, more, not intimate necessarily, but they, they've worked with you a lot closer for longer than the brief visits that you have with the transplant team, you know, every so often. So they may be able to help you talk through also who might be around because, you know, they might know a little bit more about some of the things going on in your life. And then if there's questions or concerns, you know, I think it's always a good idea if someone in your group, whether it's family or friends or some other um, combination of people that would help you after surgery, I think it's always a good idea to have um, the, some, at least someone in your life come with you to some of the transplant meetings to learn about these things firsthand. They may have different questions. Um, they may, you know, as you talk through things, may have other ideas of who can be helpful. So um, meeting with the transplant team with these people can be very, um, can be very useful too. And then um, you always, I think, it's always good for whatever your plan is, is to have a backup plan because we, you know, things change over time. Uh, people's jobs change. Uh, some jobs are more flexible than others. People's health change, the, the support people in your life. Your health issues might change. And so, you know, visiting the plan and revisiting the plan every so often and then knowing, you know, who else you might be able to reach out to is, um, is important to have those backup options also. So I think with that, Kathy takes back over. <laughs> and I appreciate your time. Um, if thanks. you have, oh, thanks, Laura. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for Laura? You shared a lot of information with us, and thank you so much for that. Um, as people might be thinking of their questions, and I don't see any in the uh, chat room, I, I wondered why I was sort of coming up with some questions, and as you went over your case scenarios, you answered most of them that I had. But I wondered if somebody had a transplant in the summer, have you found that high school age students um, are able to be the caregiver, the support person? Um, the, for those of us that have been teenagers and in our early 20s, um, for ourselves and our friends know that some of us are, some people are more mature, are very mature at 12, <laughs> and some people True. are not so mature at 30. So, um, in, uh, so in a lot of ways, having uh, people under the age of 18 they definitely can be part of a team of people helping. Um, I will say that it would make um, me a little nervous, I think, if that is um, the only person that would be able to help because it's because uh, that is it's a lot to ask of a young person who um, has a lot going on in their lives. I'm not sure what some of the legality of expecting a somebody under the age of 18, for example, to manage medications would be, or, or to help mm -hmm. support managing it, I think that would make us um, a little nervous. 
Um, doesn't mean uh, definitely part of a team. I don't. It would make me nervous if it was the only person, though. Okay. I um, I see in the chat um, that Wendy has a question. I don't. Can every? I don't know. Does everyone see the chat, or should I read it? Um. Why don't you go ahead and read it? Okay. Um, so the question is, I have a patient who does not have any support system at all. He and his brother are estranged, no parents, no friends. He's an employer but unable to provide support as we live 250 miles from a transplant center. Um, any recommendations? The, so I will say this is a center-specific issue probably. So I know that one of the transplant centers in our area is at least one, maybe more than one, is comfortable might not be the right word, but is comfortable <clears throat> in having people go to skilled nursing facilities for short periods of time post-transplant. Um, the it, it's never it, it makes a lot of us uncomfortable as Plan A because, as I had mentioned in the scenario, you have problems with medication timing and dosing, as well as a lot of people who are in skilled facilities are there because they have an infection of some sort or another. And when your immune system's lower, um, you don't really want to be around other people with infections. So it's, um, but I do know that at least one of the centers in our areas will is um, it, that it would not, that would be an option for them is a short-term stay at a skilled facility, giving someone time to to do the physical recovery. Um, it's not ideal, but it's definitely some places would be willing to consider that, um, especially if your person is very uh, is is very uh, together and knows how to reach out and advocate for themselves. Um, so that they really, you know, if they know they're supposed to get their medicine at 8 o'clock and it's, you know, 8.30 and haven't seen anybody, they can go rouse up the staff <laughs> to uh, make themselves a priority. Um, probably doesn't endear you to the staff at the facility, but it uh, is, can be effective. The issue, one of the challenges with transplant is for some people, they have the surgery and they do amazing from day one and really don't need much help at all. Um, and there are some people that have a lot of challenges from complications or um, have more pain and discomfort at the incision and so are more physically limited than others. And so, um, or, you know, my gentleman that had the issue with the infections, that makes it um, so if you have things that are more challenging, um, that's definitely when you need someone that you can reach out to. Um, and especially if you don't live close to the center, is how are you going to get there if, some, if you need to do the follow-up. So, um, but the short-term stay at a skilled facility might be something that a, some places would be willing to consider. If you've got the money and not many people on fixed incomes do um, to hire um, supports the home health agencies and the care the homemaker services that are out there they can provide some support but it's not uh, it's not that many hours um, in the grand scheme of things so unless you are private paying for more service so some people have the resources to pay for the food delivery services the um, Peapod and Amazon food delivery and things like that, um, and some will um, can hire from agencies uh, caregivers that would come in and help. Um, so that it is an option. Um, I haven't known very many people that have had the resources to do that, but it, that is an option for for a group of people. And that would be a time when people might consider doing fundraising. Now, fundraising is hard if you don't have a group of friends and family, but the um, organizations that help you do fundraising in um, pro through um, like the um, Help Hope Live, um, 
the NOTA or for the kids, CODA, I'm sorry, for the kids, um, there are transplant fundraising groups that um, people can do fundraising and donate it to this organization so it's tax deductible for the people doing the donating as opposed to GoFundMe. Um, it wouldn't show as income to the patient um, and those funds could be used towards caregivers as, as another possibility. And that's a great idea too. Um, have you found that people are able to, um, that any groups or in any ways have asked folks, um, uh, we've seen the GoFundMe pages, but um, who might be able to get people who are not people that they even know to, to be caregivers, that they've done any kind of campaigns either online or um, through their church or their community groups? to find people who would come in as volunteers? I have known people like primarily through church, for example, um, and I've seen it in families where sometimes it's easier if there's a person who is the asker, the requester, um, and can sort of put things out there um, as here's we have a specific need for this. And, you know, I need somebody that would be able to drive twice a week to downtown Chicago and, um, and a few people coming forward and, and saying, yes, they could do that. Um, in churches, for example, often there's like a volunteer group or a pastoral care group uh, or even the minister kind of knows that there's a few folks that can, you know, that are retired and like helping um, as, and I've seen people use, for like transportation in particular, people use like the um, VFW and the Elks groups, the, the fraternal organizations, even if you're not necessarily a part of it. But if you know someone who is, a lot of times they have um, people that they can coordinate to do things along those lines. So it is, um, yeah, so there are ways to be creative about it. Um, it is it is definitely more complicated for everyone if it's a group of um, a group of people, particularly if they're not family. But it is definitely something that can can be done. Okay, thanks. Um, at this point, we are nearing the close of our hour. And again, Laura, thank you so much for sharing with us today. Um, I, I would also like to um, ask folks to complete the feedback form at the um, end as you uh, sign off. And also to please join us next week or next month on the 28th for our next webinar. Um, and I see there is uh, one other comment there in the chat box um, as we close. Um, Well, I, th I think the, the comment really highlights that transplant is a decision that, um, like any of the treatment options, is a decision that individuals need to make for themselves with information from others um, and decide what works best for, for him or her. Okay. Um, thanks, Ken, for sharing your comment. And again, Laura, thanks so much. We appreciate it, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, and we will be sending out a copy of the uh, slides and the recording uh, probably next week sometime. There was a lot of information and a lot of information on the slides, so please feel free to watch them over again. And um, hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.